Hey guys, how's it going? Um, so before this headache tries to do anything, I already feel it coming on. We're all under attacks of some kind. And Satan knows one of my weaknesses is these migraines, so he's trying to give me one here like every other day. But that's alright. No matter what, we're going to make it. It was just, it was just etc. It wasn't anything serious. Okay. We're going to get right into this. So uh, just this morning, right before I started doing this, while I was looking stuff up, I was listening to Jan Markell um, on Olive Tree Ministries, and she had Chad on. And I'm really glad Chad came back and restarted his channel. Uh, there's a few people he has in his crew that are moderators that I don't agree with, because uh, I've had direct issues with some of them. But be that as it may, doesn't matter. Um, I have there for a while. I thought that... Um, someone was trying to take his channel without him knowing it and put up his videos and try to make something off of it and it looks like he actually did come back and start doing his own stuff which is good um, with the attacks that we're having now you kind of need somebody I've had people uh, come in and offer to be moderators for me um, I gave some permission to a few people and a couple of them took advantage of it uh, so I took all the permissions away. Uh, not everybody, just a couple of them. Um, but my channel's not that big, so I don't need a moderator. I'm able to keep up with everything okay. But when you get big, you're going to need a moderator. Uh, you need somebody who can edit stuff and, and put stuff out, you know, and deal with the comments. Because, it, guys, I'm telling you, you get hateful comments, you got to block them. They will not change. You have to block them. It's, it seems harsh. But my reputation is blocking people, and they give up. So they go and they hit the dislike button, um, and they don't get what they want. I don't let them have their voice and let them have their, their time, because nobody wants to hear what they have to say anyway. But I'm not going to let them attack my subscribers either. This is our church. This is our little group and our family. I'm not going to let them attack you guys. There's no reason for it. There are people that comment on my channel that don't comment on other channels because they get attacked all the time. And I want a safe place for us to be able to fellowship in the comment sections. So... Chad uh, was talking with Jan on here, and they're talking about the sinking ship. Uh, everything that's going on right now, it, it's, it's a sinking ship. And the one thing I thought about this morning was, if the ship is, sink is sinking, what are you going to do? Are you going to tread water? Are you going to give up and drown? Or are you going to walk on the water to the Lord? Remember that in the Bible? Think about it. With faith. It was with by faith he walked on water to the Lord. When he looked down at the world and the troubles around him, what happened? In fact, in fact, indulge me please, let's go look at that. Because this, uh, the, the, everything that was talked about it was amazing. And it, it goes right to this scripture. in John 6, 15 through 21. He was in Capernaum again. <laughs> okay, let's go to John 6, 15 through 21. Let's take a look. John 6, 15 through 21. Jesus walks on water. What an appropriate title. So starting in John 6, 16. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was already dark and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose, being a great wind, because of a great wind, it was blowing. If you spend any time in the ocean, you know when the wind picks up, the, the, the seas you start to get white caps uh, out in the swell. And it's not good for boats. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. What an example this is of what's happening right now. Look how many people are, are, are scared to be religious because of the way the world is. They're seeing Jesus walk toward them, and they're afraid. He's like, well, no, it's just me. It's just me. The time is coming. I'm here. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at land where they were going. Now, this isn't the one I was looking for. Why did it take me to this one? Okay, it'll be Matthew 14, 22, 33. Matthew 14... 22, 33. I am struggling with my coordination this morning. 
I don't know if you can, my hands are shaking and my fingers are herky jerky. It's weird. It's that disease. Anyway, let's get to it. So Matthew 14, 22, immediately Jesus made disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Now, you know, something you got to wonder here, this is one of those little hidden gems. What was he telling them? I wonder what was what he said to them to send them away. Because they were there for a reason. Kind of makes you wonder what all was said, what all has what all gone on that we don't know about. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost, and they cried out for fear. Now I want to point out something, too. Whenever you look at the boat, it talks about the wind was contrary. Um, when they, And even back then, even the little boats had, had a sail of some kind. And they would pull the sail, they'd bring the jib around and put it into, so the, it would catch the wind. Well, if the wind was contrary to what they were doing, which if they were trying to go to Capernaum, the wind was probably blowing either dead at them, which then they would have to quarter and catch the sail and, and push the boat that way uh, with a heavy rudder, or they would have to turn and go way up and then turn and come way back down this way. And sometimes you can run a healthy zigzag pattern through there. But if the wind is contrary enough, you can't do anything. You got to drop sail and you got to row the boat because it'll actually hit the sail and knock the boat over. If you've if you boated, you know what I'm talking about. And so they were fighting with the wind out there, and it was so bad they had to, just like in John, they had to row. So they were rowing, fighting the sea, fighting the wind. So the wind must have been head on at them. Uh, they saw a ghost and they cried out with fear. Verse 27, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter had answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, I don't know if Peter was testing him or what was going on. I, I kind of think, I kind of get the sense Peter was testing him. <clears throat> so he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. Look at what's happening here. There's so much happening here. Let's break this down. One verse and, and so much is going on. So Peter's walking by faith. He climbs down out of the boat, standing on the water, water splashing all over his legs, standing on the water, and he's walking towards the Lord. And you know there's probably a thousand thoughts going through his head. Are we near the shore? Is it shallow water? What's going on here? And he's walking towards him. Well, the wind's blowing, so he's focused on the Lord. All of a sudden, the wind's blowing. He becomes aware of it. And he's like, oh, I just realized where I am. So he's by faith, focused. Nothing's getting in his way. And all of a sudden, the troubles of the world start coming in. And he's like, oh, oh no. Oh, look at the water. Oh, man, they got sharks in here. Oh, no. What am I going to do? And he starts losing his focus. Does that not describe us with what we're going through here? He starts losing his focus. His faith starts to fade because he's focused on the things around him. He began to sink. The world was dragging him down. How many Christians are going through that right now? How many people on here who have asked for prayer requests are going through that right now? This story is for you. I wasn't even going to talk about this today, and this is what we got led to. And We haven't even gotten to the subject of the video, which is the letters to the churches. Cried out saying, Lord, save me. That's what we do. When we realize we're in trouble. Lord, save me. Look what happens. And immediately, without hesitation, immediately, we call out to the Lord immediately. He stretches forth his hand and catches us and says to us, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I know I changed some of the words, but think about that. Take these scriptures and apply them to you. What if that was you? Apply it to you. And it changes how much it means. It changes how much authority and power it has. And it makes it much more real. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? If Peter would have noticed all that stuff going around, looked, I don't care. I, I want to go stand with my Lord. Didn't even worry about it. he was on water. Just walked to him and grabbed a hold of his hands. Just looked at him. Nothing would have happened. But his faith struggled. It's because of the world. And that's what the world's doing today. We're sinking. The boat's sinking, we're sinking. <clears throat> that's why I asked you. 
when the boat sinks, and it's going to sink, what are you going to do? Are you going to give up and drown? Are you going to tread water and fight the system? Fight against all of it? Or are you going to get up on the water and walk in faith to the Lord? I'm going to walk in faith. I don't care what the world does. I'm not worried about what's going on around me. I want the Lord. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. So clearly, you can see that this was a test. He was showing them something. Amazingly enough, this wasn't just for them. This, because honestly, why would this story be in the Bible? If you think about what the Lord's trying to tell us, there's a message in here and it's for us. This was done 2,000 years ago to be written down so we would read it and it would apply to us in this time right now. Almost all of this Bible was intended for us at this time right now, for the people that would live in the final hundred years before the tribulation. That's what this was meant. It was meant to tell us. Now, it applies to everybody, but it was meant for us, for a people not yet born, not yet created, for people who would be at the end. Because it's so bad now. There was martyrdom and stuff going on back then, but you know what? You knew where you stood, and you knew what was coming. Here, we don't know. Everything's in turmoil. Everything's up and down. Everything's every direction. You don't know who you can trust. This was for us. This was for the people that live now. Verse 33, Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Why did they say he was the Son of God? Because he walked on water? Or maybe... It'd be better if they said, you are the son of God, and I think you're the son of God because you do the only, you are the only one who can do what the son of God would do, which is not walk on water and have Peter come out and walk on water, but prove to Peter why he needs to have faith. It's not about the walking on the water. It's about trusting. Do you trust me? Walk to me. That's what it, it's all about faith, guys. It's, it always comes back to faith. These are the, the deeper, more hidden meanings within these things. Now that we've done now that we've done that, <clears throat> hopefully that made sense to everybody. But but honestly, it, it, what are you gonna do? Are you going to trust him when with everything you see? For example, let's say suddenly all Christians have to go to jail. And they come to your house and take you. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna fight kicking and screaming? You can put your hands out. Don't say a word. And let them take you. If we know that that's a possibility, why would we fight it? Faith in the Lord. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but what if it did? What are you going to do? Have you asked yourself that question? Have you prepared yourself for that? I, when I'm out and about, I'm, I, every day, every day, I'm waiting to see suddenly everything changes. Hey, we know you're a Christian. We've been watching you know, your YouTube and everything. Okay. You have to come with us. Okay. I'm not going to deny them. Let's go. I don't know what they're going to do to me. Don't care. But I already know it's coming because I got warnings. The Lord said, hey, this could happen to you. Be ready. Faith. I'm going to trust him. He'll either bring me out of it or he'll bring me through it. One or the other. So it's all about trust, guys. Every bit of it is about trust and faith. Let me put that in him. Let's get to the subject matter of the video. Okay, so I was watching. Woo, that's not what I wanted. Hold on a second. Let me get rid of this. See, my hands, I can't control them. My dexterity is getting bad. Okay, so anyway, I was watching this. Uh, Chad said some good things. Actually, Jan read a couple of letters um, showing a, a great example of what... Uh, people are thinking about out there and it was really good and Chad responded very well to them um, so I'm really glad Chad came back I'm really glad he kept he got his channel back going again and he's putting it out there because a lot of people need this truth message uh, he was one of the great powerful watchmen and when he started telling the truth he got attacked we all did all of us got attacked it was funny because we all got attacked about the same time um, what was the other one uh, Blue Heaven um, I can't think of all the people. A bunch of people. And I went and talked to them. A whole bunch of us got attacked all at once by the same people. Supposedly, they were in our community. We were together. 
So, I don't know. But I'm glad he didn't give up and stay away. This is a calling for life, and we have to keep doing it. We can say, I'm done. Many times, I say, that's what I've said, I'm finished. Nope. Or says, no, you're not. <laughs> you belong to me. I have a service for you. Go for it. And that's when I had gotten to that point where, before things, before I blew the lid off all this nonsense going on with the Grace community, and it was just literally two days before that, I was in prayer to the Lord, and I was like, Lord, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to do this? And immediately, the impression was on me. I called you for a reason. All right, Lord, send me then. If this is what you want me to do, send me. Here it come. And that letter came out, everything, all together, the other video, everything. And it was so funny because what they were doing instantly, everything was transparent. I could see exactly what was happening. Whereas the day before, I couldn't. Okay. And I, so I went in and I blew the lid off it. And look what happened. Instantly, people that told me they loved me the day before, the very next day, called me names, made fun of me, and condemned me. Same people. They've got an issue. And that's why I don't, I don't belong to that community anymore. I'm going to stand out here with my true brothers and sisters who do really do love me and appreciate what is going on in my ministry here. And I'm glad Chad stood up and did it too. And I hope he keeps standing up because a lot of people, he has a lot of a big following and it connects to a lot of people. I hope he keeps going. So if you guys want, go over to Jan Markell's YouTube channel. And it's the latest video that went up this morning. And you guys can watch that video. Now. Let's get into what we were going to talk about. And we're going to talk about the letters. Because this has been a put on my heart to do this for several, well, over a week now. And I've been talking about doing it and haven't done it. Well, today I'm going to do it. I've got plenty of time. Because we need to go through these letters. Because these letters are warnings. Now, when you read through these letters, you know, and you go back and check in history. <sighs> check in history. And you see that the seven churches existed back then. We can actually look at the map and see just where they are. Amazingly, when you do an aerial shot of it, and then take a, a shot of the Pleiades star cluster and lay it over there. It's like that close to being a perfect match. It's weird. Um, but those churches are, I mean, some of the buildings are still there, but those churches are gone. They've been gone for a long time. Why are these letters so pertinent? And why are they in this book? And why are they so applicable to us? Well, because when you go back and look at the last 2,000 years, you can see each of those church mentalities he talks about in here in different blocks of time in history over the last 2,000 years. You can literally break up the last 2,000 years into chunks that match those seven churches. The final chunk, which is what we're in now, you see that mentality of all those churches in the body of Christ today, in Christendom. Every one of those are in there. You, you fall in one category or another in these letters that we're about to read through. As a Christian, as a believer, where your mentality is, you fall in one of those church ideas, one of those categories. And this was meant for those churches, but it was meant for us at this time. This whole book is for us at this time. So let's go through and let's take a look at what he says. We're going to start in chapter 1, but we're not going to start at the beginning. We're going to start down here. Because John has, because John was having, John had a pretty rough real rough he, he lived longer than the rest of them and he um went through a lot of stuff and had a lot of depression john was fighting through a lot of things and he was had, had to live among heathens and he had and unbelievers and he had to witness so much stuff that was going on that that where the, they were they were trying to tear the church down satan was attacking every, every day and john was coming under a lot of attacks but there was a reason why john was made to stick around because of this book right here. It was after this book was done that he was he was, he was uh, put to death. So this book is extremely important. Now he had a vision in chapter 1 of the Son of, Son of Man. And there's actually some details in here, very interesting details in here, that I want to cover at some point, but I'm not going to cover them right now because they link back to some other scriptures. So, but... um. We're going to get into the, the actual point of this right now. And he, Jesus is telling him in verse 11, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Seven churches. So he lists, and those churches were active at that time frame. 
Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. Now, and they, and this is funny because that this is the verse they use to, to say that Jesus is a woman because they in the King James it says he was girded about the paps. Well, that's the breasts. Well, when you look at the actual word, it's the feminine use of the word in Greek, and that's where they got that from. And I did a video and I showed all that. That's not what that means. Not even at all. Because the literal word means a, a him, a person, a man. Verse 14, his hair, or his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. There's another tidbit of information there. I'll cover it some other time. Ah, let's just cover it now. His hair was white as wool, and if you go back in Daniel 7, you see the same description of God. Because Daniel's looking at him and he describes what he looks like sitting in an ancient of days. And then Jesus comes in. Chapter 5 of Revelation, you see that, where Jesus comes in. He describes him. Same description. Jesus is like God. God, Jesus. Same thing. Anyway, there's so much of this stuff in here, guys. His feet were like fine brass and, and as it refined, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. There's that many waters thing. He speaks in every language at once. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. That's the word of God we speak. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. We have that two-edged sword also. That's the word of God. Verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. John heard that same statement back in Matthew. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. If he has the keys of Hades and death, you remember? Remember who, who opens the gates of hell? Keys of Hades and death, remember that? Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. Now, this is a key verse because elsewhere in the Bible you see this same referencing, but it doesn't tell you who it references. Here it does. This is a key for those other verses. So if you ever see golden lampstands, you know who it's talking about. You ever see star, seven stars, you know who it's talking about. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So all seven of those mentalities have an angel ruling over them. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So now you know what this is referencing. Now, let's get into some meat and potatoes. The church in Ephesus. Now listen to this. We're going to unpack this. If you got an opportunity, pause the video, go grab you something to drink and a snack because we may be here for a minute because there's a lot of stuff in here. And it applies to right now. Revelation 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write. So John is taking dictation right now. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Stop. He walks in the midst of the churches. The seven golden lampstands are the churches, right? That's what it said in the previous verse in the previous chapter. He's walking amongst the churches. He's here with us. He's watching everything we're doing. Listen, Christian. He's watching everything we're doing. Think about that. We, we won't get away with anything. He's seeing everything we're doing. In here, in here, and with these hands. He's seeing it. Think about that. That should give you great conviction. Verse 2. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Who's done this? Anybody? Anybody? I've done it. I've talked to a few other people who've done it too. Take the word of God and show them. People that are calling themselves apostles today. There's a bunch of us that have. We're like, no, you're not apostles. Here's the word of God that says that. Here's the criteria for an apostle. You're not an apostle. You can't be. Remember, this is talking to us now. It was talking to them, but it's talking to us now. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Verse 3, And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. They stood in faith. They knew what was set before them and kept trucking. Kept on moving. 
So these are great Christians. They're doing exactly what they're supposed to do. Verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. What was their first love? Now, he's singing their praises in the first three verses. Nevertheless, verse 4, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. What was their first love? Let's read some more and see what we can find out. Verse 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent. Now, he, keep in mind as we read this, he's talking to believers. He's talking to Christians. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. What? He's going to remove their lampstand? That's kind of serious. These lampstands are reside in the throne room of God. There's other stuff in Isaiah and Zechariah and Ezekiel that talk about this too. Very elaborate descriptions of what, what it looks like. He's going to remove their lampstand? These are model Christians. They left their first love. What was their first love? Verse 6, But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. This one verse destroys the Nicolaitan mentality. I've run into several of these people that preach what the Nicolaitans preach and say, if you want to be a true Christian, you have to believe like they do. And I said, no, you do not. Jesus hates you. How dare you say that to me? Well, first of all, your pride isn't going to get you anything. Second of all, Revelation 2.6 says Jesus hates you because that's Jesus saying he hates you. So I told the one guy, because he was the boldest, I said, so for you, in order for you to be right, you have to deny the very word of your Lord and Savior you claim to follow. Repent. Turn back to God. Abandon this idea. The Nicolaitans, no. Bad juju. There's a lot of people that say they were the true Christians. No, they were not. Jesus hates them. <laughs> if he hates them, they're not true Christians. But they left their first love. What was their first love? Now, that's a study I'll leave you guys to do. What the first love was of the church of Ephesus. Think about what your first love was. Joy in the Lord. Praying to the Lord. Singing to the Lord. Talking to the Lord. Giving. What was the first thing that, that really you were fired up about? Go back to that. I try to look at myself and see if I've done that. I, I think I have. Now, I'm going to change this color because you can't even see that. Uh, green? Nope. Let's just clear it out. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And we're going to, at the end, we're going to go and see who the overcomer is. And I've showed you guys this before. So that's a blessing to them. It's also a warning. To the church in Smyrna, and to the angel in the church of Smyrna, write, these things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now, he, he's talking about Jews, and he's also talking about Christians who are trying to be Jews. We have that happening today. We have a lot of Christians that are getting into the Torah and the Mishnah and getting into the, uh, the uh, other one from Babylon. They're, they're getting into that, and they're saying that if you want to be perfect, you've got to convert to Judaism. No. No, that's not what it was intended for us to do that. The book of Acts tells us what we're supposed to do. We're not, we're not to convert, yet we have Christians doing that because they have no faith. And what they're doing is they're aligning themselves with the synagogue of Satan. Verse 10, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now that links back to, uh, where was it? 
Matthew 24, I think. There was a part in there where Jesus was talking about that. This is, this is what he was talking about. There's a lot of people are on the fence about who he was referring to, that we were all... Some people are, are t telling other Christians, yeah, you we're all going to suffer for 10 days and all that kind of stuff. Well, not necessarily. He's referring this to a specific church, Smyrna. Verse 11, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Shall not be hurt by the second death. Now, when we did the church of Ephesus, remember, they left their first love we're going to find out what that first love is at the end of this. To the church of Pergamum. Now, Pergamum, if you know um, any of your Greek and Roman history, Pergamum was an actual city. And they had a big, giant temple there. Uh, the Temple of Apollos. And in that, and they found it back in the, I don't know, back before World War II, World War I. Um, and they actually found a room that was perfectly preserved, hadn't been touched, hadn't collapsed, nothing. And there was a big statue in the middle of it. It's actually the throne of Satan. And they dismantled it and took it to Germany. I've talked about that in other videos before. It was funny because two years later, Hitler started killing Jews after that. Hitler, a guy that came out of nowhere, weird, to the church in Pergamum. So this is where they were. And he even talks about this here. And the, to the angel, Revelation chapter 2, 12, and to the angel in the church of Pergamum write, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. That's, that's what Satan's throne is. You can go up and you can Google pictures of it. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Antipas uh, was killed after Stephen. But I have a few things against you. So he's like, hey, y'all been strong. I see where you're at. You're, you're, you're struggling. But I have this against you. They still were imperfect. Because you have there those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. They made them believe it was okay for them to do that. Oh, no, no, it's okay. It's just food. They were using the word of God to tell them, oh, it's okay, you can have this. He's not going to condemn you. But they forgot to go read the part where it says, don't eat things sacrificed to idols. In fact, that's what the apostles told the Gentiles in the book of Acts. Don't eat things sacrificed to idols. These guys taught exactly the opposite. And they told them the sexual thing was okay. Oh, he's not going to condemn you. It's okay. Revelation 2.15 Thus, you also have those who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Here's number two. So here's two verses that... No. Nicolaitans, bad juju. There's still people today that believe that. Revelation 2.16 Repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He's going to present the word of God to them and say, look, you're wrong. So they need to change, or he's going to come deal with them. There's a lot of Christians with, that, with this frame of mind. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Jesus has a name that only he knows. It's written on his thigh. Only he knows it. But we're going to have that too. We're going to be like Jesus. So these guys, and we have Christians today. Now, so far, these churches we've gone through, think about who, who falls into these categories. And how these things apply to today. A lot of people fall under these categories. Now we have the church of Pergamum. People who are standing right there where Satan is. They're not, not willing to get away from it. Fighting and fighting and fighting. But there's, there's problems. And they got to fix it. But he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To he who overcomes. To him who overcomes. Now let's go to the church in Thyatira. And to the angel in the church of Thyatira, Revelation 2.18, Right. These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass. There's a reason why he's, he's addressing that, what he just talked about in chapter 1. Hello? Hello? Hello, this is Lynn. 
go away, Satan. Um, there's a reason why he's talking about those, why he's going back and mentioning those. Verse 19, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Let me, hold on a second here. Let me clear this. Because the words in red are hard to see when you put a different color on there. Okay. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. So he's referencing their works. The last works are more than the first. They, they grew. They grew in, in service to the Lord. But he's got a problem with them. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. So you see, it's like, they seem like model Christians. They're doing the right thing, but now there's issues. But nevertheless, I have this against you because you allow the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. When I blew the lid off all this nonsense that was going on in the grace community and how many people had drawn together under a couple of people, there were several women that were being used by this Jezebel spirit to, and a lot of people disagree with that. It's, it's, a, it's a way of believing in a frame of mind. It's a, it's a demonic influence. Using them trying to get to several of us. And one in particular, well two, but one in particular, turned a lot of people against a lot of us who were teaching the truth. The can't we all just get along mentality. Oh, we need to stop being so hateful. Now this is a new Christian trying to teach Christians who have been a Christian for a while how to read the Bible. It's like, no. You don't know what you're talking about. You think you're going to seduce the enemy with love and caring and, and gentleness? Satan's still going to try to kill you. You can't make him turn. But they tried. And people tolerate that. You ha cannot tolerate this. When you see it, you must address it immediately and firmly. And I did that. That's, that's what, that's what cat was a catalyst for all that nonsense that went on. Because I saw this happening. And it was so subtle, but then all of a sudden, bam, there it was. I saw very clearly, it was very transparent what was happening. And a lot of people went along with it, and they still are. I've separated from everybody. It's funny, because one of them keeps... The main one that got aligned with her, he keeps sending me messages. I blocked him on my phone. I have his, I have his number. I blocked him. Yet you can go into your settings, and you can look and see if they've sent you messages. Because to them, they're still sending them. And he just he keeps sending me messages. It's like, You've corrupted yourself with this Jezebel. No. No. I love you, brother, but I can't. I can't fellowship with you because you won't let this go. Because you want to be the whole all get, oh, I can't have anybody hate me. I can't have anybody look down on me. No, the truth is the truth. Why do you think they hated Jesus? Because he told them the truth. He rejected this stuff. Very sternly, very openly. But this is where Christians are. They're like, oh yeah, this is awesome. We, we can do this. She says she believes. I believe her. Without ever testing her. Verse 21, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Now a lot of people are saying, well, this was an actual woman. True. But this is also a mentality. Because the actual Jezebel lived several hundred years before this letter was written. So who's this Jezebel? It's not actually Jezebel. It's the spirit of Jezebel. It's an understanding. It's a frame of mind. It's a it's a it's a influence. Because you go read in the Bible, the actual Jezebel. That's Old Testament. She was trying to kill uh, Elijah. Yeah, that's godly. That's a, a thousand years before this, I think, somewhere around there. So this isn't Jezebel. This is the spirit of Jezebel, influencing. One woman. And they she'll, this demon will always find a woman to use. A woman or a very handsome man. They always try to pick somebody who's, who everybody's going to like. Who everybody's going to feel sorry for. Bam, right there. That's it. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed. And those who commit adultery with her 
doesn't have to be sexual relations. Adultery can be, I'm listening to this doctrine and running from my Lord. I'm married to Jesus Christ. I listen to his doctrine. No one else's. I don't care what they say. The, what the Word of God says. That's what I'm paying attention to. Well, if I go after someone else and believe what they're saying, I'm now committing adultery on, with Christ, on Christ with them. No. Here's what he's saying here. Verse 22. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. What great tribulation is he talking about? I only know of one time frame listed as the great tribulation in the Bible. Now, you can suffer through a lot of tribulation, but I don't ever hear about our normal tribulations referred to as great tribulation. I only hear of one. Remember what I told you? There's some Christians who are walking a very fine line between being taken in the rapture and not. They will be here because they need to repent, and they're not going to repent. These letters are talking about that. They're warnings. There are Christians out there who are not, they're walking on the other side of that line, and they're going to get left here. Why do you think the, the great multitude is so big? In the world today, there's 2.7 billion Christians. Are 2.7 billion people getting raptured? Or are most of them going to be in the great multitude after the sixth seal, right before the tribulation starts, or right as it starts? Think about it. Now, some of them are going to be seeds planted. But a lot of them are going to be Christians who were committing adultery with Jezebel who are following after other doctrines, who are believing things that aren't biblical. Do you think Christ is going to take a bride that is committing adultery on him? No. He's going to take a bride who is devoted to him. Who's going in the rapture? Those are that are devoted to him. It's all here in the Bible. So all this nonsense people talking about, oh, everybody that believes is going. I don't think so. That's not what I'm, what I'm seeing here. He's going to cast them into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. The common theme here is repent, repent, repent. I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Again, keep in mind, he's talking to Christians here. We're not above judgment we're above that judgment, the great white throne judgment. We're not above judgment. We will be judged. It's a warning for us to watch ourselves. Make sure we're following where we should be. Now to you, I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine. What doctrine? Listen to this verse, and we're going to go back from it. Listen to this. This proves that was a Jezebel spirit, not a woman. Now to you I say to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. I will put on you no other burden. That's, the, that's the, from Acts when the apostles were talking to the Gentiles. You think he's probably talking to Gentiles here? <laughs> Peter said, we will put on you no other burden. Do these four things and you're good. We will lay on you no other burden. Now look at here. Doctrine. As many as do not have this doctrine. What doctrine? Well, the last four verses he was talking about the doctrine. The doctrine of Jezebel. Eating sac things sacrificed to idols. That can, that can mean eating food or it can mean receiving doctrines. The doctrine of Christ is the word of God is food indeed. That can there's other meanings to these things. It's not just sitting down and going, "Hey, did you take this T-bone steak and did you set it before an idol and, and say I sacrifice you to an idol? Did you butcher this cow?" It can also mean false doctrine, sacrifice to idols, and the sexual immorality. I showed I showed you it can be. Now it's not just sexual acts. It can be you going after some other god. But you're supposed to be saved. Christians do that. It's horrible. He gave her time to repent. Verse 21. She did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed. Now, it sounds like he's talking about a woman. But listen. 
I will, indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one according to your works. So it sounds like he's talking about a specific person, as many as do not have this doctrine. Think about it, guys. Little hidden gems in here are telling us exactly what he's talking about. This is a belief and an understanding, a belief system and an understanding. We have to be careful what we're believing. Who have not known, but hold fast to what you have till I come. Hang on. Verse 26, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. There's some clear warnings going on here. If you're aligning yourself with Jezebel, you've got an issue. And clearly, it is a doctrine. This is Christ's own words. To the church in Sardis, Revelation 3.1, And to the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. That you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. What church does this immediately make you think of? Evangelical. Holy Spirit laughing. All that, uh, you give a thousand dollar gift and God will magnify it and multiply it. Jim Baker. Uh... Who's the other one? <laughs> um, in Houston. O Osteen. Verse 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. This would be people that believe paying a tithe is going to get you something from God. Pay your tithe. God will bless you back. Pay your tithe. Get your receipt and take it off your taxes and just recycle the same tithe over and over again. God will bless you. No. That's not giving. That's you taking one gift and just flipping it. Verse 3. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast. Your first love. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I will come. Remember the... The master and the servants. The, the, the servant that says, ah, it's, he's going to be a while. It starts attacking the other servants and beating them and drinking and partying, living it up. I will come upon you. If you not watch, I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I will come. That's Christians. He's talking only to Christians, not unbelievers. When you, when you read this with that understanding, it changes what this means. Because a lot of people read this and think, oh, it's not talking about me. Uh, it's talking directly to us. Verse 4, you have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Now, all these people that are going on about, well, you can't pray that we're worthy, because that, that's, that's a work. We're all worthy. No, we're not. Why would Jesus say this in Revelation 3, 4? They will walk. You've got people. You're a dead church, but you've got a few people in here that haven't defiled their garments. They will walk with me in white because they're worthy to do so. That means the rest of them aren't. We, we should be praying, Lord, I pray we're worthy. That's why I do it. Guys, these little tidbits like this are what explain these things and they're what tell us what's going on. And there are so, most Christians today don't get this because they don't read the Bible and apply it to themselves. They don't read it and go, where did, how does this uh, link to me? How does this, what does this say to me? And when they find something that doesn't match, they do one of two things. They either address it and change it, or they go, ah, uh, I'm okay. I'm saved. I'm okay. No. You're saved, but you're not okay. Why is he telling a church they're dead? Evidently, they're not okay. You think you're alive, but you're actually dead. Dead church. Luke, lukewarm. Not, not even lukewarm. Just dead. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. 
Remember how you, the blessings you received. Remember your free salvation. Remember how you figured it out. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names. Have not defiled our garments. They are worthy, and they will walk with me. Guys, you need to know, you need to realize this. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. That's, that's members of the bride. The rest of them, great multitude. The great multitude isn't the bride. The bride is the one getting raptured. The great multitude is not. That's a different group of people. I did a video showing only the bride and, the, and Christ wear fine linen. Only the apostles wear fine linen. There's a select group of individuals that wear fine linen. Everyone else just wears white robes. They get fine linen and white robes. It, Revelation chapter 19, when it describes Jesus coming back, the bride, her bride, his bride has made herself ready, dressed in fine linen, clean and white. Then it goes a little further and talks about the army coming back with him, ten thousands of his saints, dressed in fine linen. That's the bride. That's those taken in the rapture. Not every Christian is going in the rapture. It's in the Bible. This is the truth. Not every Christian is going. Because there are some Christians that need work. A lot of it. And it's going to take the fire of tribulation to change them. Unless they listen to people like me that are trying to tell them. There's no condemnation for them. But there's very little reward too. Whole churches. Whole congregations. If, if they're able to get together the following Sunday after the rapture happens. Are going to be sitting there going, what happened? Why are we still here? Many of them will figure this out. Now, the one thing that uh, is funny that uh, uh, David Coverstone had said in the dream he had, he said he saw uh, churches and preachers were preaching against sin, something that's never happened before. But in the congregation, wolves were sitting in there, and people were listening to the wolves and not to the preachers. And he, he said that he thought that was going to happen before the rapture. No. That's going to happen after. Gap of time between the rapture and the start of everything. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Verse 5, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. Remember the overcomer thing, we're going to get back to that. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. What a guarantee. But how interesting he says, I won't blot his name out of the book of life. I've heard a lot of people's takes on this. Most people seem to think, well, that's not him talking about actually blotting a name out. There's other stuff in the Bible that seems to talk about it could happen. How would it happen? Reading this, you would tend to think, well, I guess it's somebody who doesn't overcome. Could it be a Christian? There's no condemnation for Christians, so no. See, we don't fully understand this because we don't study it deeper. I think this is meant as a guarantee for us, but I also think it's meant as a warning back here to go, I better watch my P's and Q's. I know I'm not condemned, but I don't want, I don't want him upset with me either. So we fix ourselves. I will confess his name before my Father and before the angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, Philadelphia... And almost every Christian I've ever talked to says they are of the Church of Philadelphia. Well, let's see. Verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. Remember the door thing we talked about this morning? An open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. A lot of people are saying, oh, you, you, you're not saved, you can't be saved. You don't believe this, you're not saved. If you're not obeying the Ten Commandments, you're not saved. You don't have the ability or the right to shut that door, and you can't do it. He told you you can't. Jesus says, I've opened that door. Get in here. There are people standing outside that door. They're looking in. They're not walking in. And nobody can shut that door. Nobody can tell you you're not saved. 
Nobody can tell you you can't be saved. Nobody can tell you there's no hope for you, like Christians love to do. Oh, you smoke? Oh, you can't. Oh, you drink? Oh, you can't be saved. No. Are you living in sin? Can't be saved. How many people did Jesus save that were, that were living in sin back then? Hello? It's all in the Bible. Verse 9. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan. Remember we talked about this at the beginning? I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are, and are not but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. See, I love going through this slow and, and unpacking a lot of this because it, it causes, when you read through it, you just read through it. But when you take the time to go through it and talk about it, it's, you start remembering other scriptures like, wait a minute, he talked about that here. He talked about that here. What is this reference to? And you learn a whole lot more. Verse 10, because you have kept my command to persevere. Just a second, guys. I just realized something needs to be done. Give me just a second. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I don't remember where I was. Okay, here we are. Verse 9. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews but are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. If he's talking about that and referencing that, can we go into the world today and see that specifically? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Simple Google search show you every bit of this. Verse 10. <clears throat> verse 10. This is rapture verse. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now there's a lot of people that say it's a literal hour. There's a reason why the tribulation is coming. It's twofold. Mainly, it's for the Jews. It's Jacob's trouble. It's for God to deal with them and their uh, inability to obey him and to stay faithful to him. He took his hands off them for a while. Of course, he blesses them amazingly. Took his hands off them for a while to get the church square away. When the church is out of the way, then that's when he's going to deal with Israel. The secondary fix or secondary issue that's going to be covered in, in the tribulation or by the tribulation is for all of the people who denied him, all the people who refused to get saved, all the people who didn't listen, all the Christians who got saved and then went right back into the world again and decided not to listen and respond to the word, but go their own direction, commit adultery, go and get in bed with Jezebel, follow other doctrines. Do all the things exactly the opposite of what he said to do. Those fires, that fire of indignation is going to cause them to change. It's going to put conviction in their heart and they're going to repent. And it's going to take that to get them to do it. Because we're talking to people like that today and they will not listen. It's going to set people on fire. They're going to remember the conversations we're having here. That's why I tell you guys, take authority in the word and start telling people, look, this is what it says. That's what it says. If you choose not to do that, it's on you. It's warnings. We have to warn people. That's why I've been doing these videos that I've been doing. That's why I've been talking about this stuff. Those people will be here. Because it's going to take that the opening of the seals, that first part, to really shake them and get them to answer the call, to respond, to open the door. Great multitude. We're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to look at that briefly. He says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. So, he had a really good report for uh, Philadelphia. A lot of people, a lot of, most Christians say they're in the church of Philadelphia. Yet, you go back and they lead the other churches where Jesus had problems and told them to repent. And you see them doing those things. <laughs> it's like, no, you're in that church. Verse 12, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Oh, here we go. Hold on. Hello? Buenos dias. Mi nombre es Graciela Gomez. ¿Habla español? 
Uh, no. ¿No habla español? No. Ok. Mi nombre... Mi, mi. Do you speak Spanish? No. Uh, let me keep talking to you in the Spanish then. <laughs> I don't get it. Uh. Hello? Round two? She was about to tell me her name, but that's mi nombre. I know just enough Spanish to go to find out where the bathroom is and to get put in jail. Just in, just enough. <laughs> okay, verse 12. He who overcomes. Whoops. Satan is really desperately trying to get me to not do this. And that's good because that means we're on the right track. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar because that phone hasn't hardly rang in the last couple weeks, months. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in my temple of my God, and shall go, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. I, I like the Hebrew way of saying Jerusalem. We say it because that's the English word Jerusalem, but the actual the Hebrew word is is Yerushalayim. I like I like that word. Uh, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Now, this is a name that we don't know, only Jesus knows, but he's going to write that name on these people, on us. The reason why he's going to do that is because we're his bride. Verse 13, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now we're in Laodicea. Oh, Laodicea. Laodicea. As we go through this and start unpacking it, you're going to start immediately start thinking about, whoa, I know these people. To the church in Laodicea, Revelation 3.14, and to the angel of the church of Laodicea, right. Of the Laodiceans, right. These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I'm going to stop right there and point something out. Uh, we had a guy comment on a one of John, John Barnett's videos talking about how people who call Jesus Jesus, or Jesus, um, they're not using his Hebrew name and they deny him by not using his Hebrew name. Well, right here in chapter or chapter 3 of Revelation in verse 14, no, yeah, you're right, David, now isn't the time to be lukewarm. Chapter 4, or verse 14, he's, his name is Amen. His name is Faithful. His name is True Witness. Amen, Faithful, True Witness. And his name is Beginning of the Creation of God. So there's four of Jesus' names right there. Why do you pick Yeshua? In Hebrew, and I've had every version of this preached to me because people think I'm less of a Christian because I don't use those names. Some people say you have to, in order for you to be saved, you have to call him Yeshua. Some people say you have to call him Yahshua, which is the actual Hebrew pronunciation for Joshua. That's the English version of that name. Some people say it has to be Yehoshua. Some people say it has to be Yahoshua. Some people say it has to be Yahweh. Some people have, say it has to be Yahweh. Some people say it has to be... Uh, the right pronunciation is vav Yadhe or yadhe vav depending on how you want to put the letters together. That's the Tetragrammaton, which is the name of God. So they pick all these different versions of the Hebrew, same Hebrew name, and they don't realize that everything was written in Greek back then. And if you go... To the Greek, his name is Ayos, or, or Yaios, and that translates to Emmanuel. I don't understand where they're getting this from. It doesn't make any sense. But these are people that are trying to be Jews, and they're not. The synagogue of Satan. They will condemn you because you don't call him Yeshua. I do call him Yeshua when I call him Jesus. I call him Yeshua when I call him Lord. I call him Yeshua when I call him Amen. I call him Yeshua when I call him Faithful. I call him Yeshua when I call him True Witness. I call him Yeshua when I call him Beginning of the Creation of God. That's just four of the 150 plus names he has in the Bible. People kill me. God didn't put any stipulations on salvation, but I'm going to put stipulations on your salvation. No, you're not. You're going to go over there and sit down somewhere and be quiet and let the adults talk. 
Revelation 3.15. I know some of y'all love it when I say that. <laughs> Revelation 3.15, I know your works. You ought to see a look on an adult's face when you tell them that. I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I could wish you were hot, cold or hot. That's funny that David commented that we just got into Laodicea. I could wish you were cold or hot. Jesus can work with someone who's cold. Jesus can work with someone who's hot. He can't work with someone who's lukewarm. A person that's hot, that's on fire for the Lord, they're fully in the fold. A person that's cold, they're fully out of the fold. Remember the, the, the uh, analogy I gave you this morning about the sheep? Some sheep, they just, nope, I'm out. He can go get them and bring them back. Leave the, leave the 99 and go get the, the 100th and bring them back. That's cold. The 99, he's got them. He can deal with that. The lukewarm, these are the ones that hang out. The indifferent ones, they hang out outside. You go to try to get them, run. See, that cold one that went way out there, that cold one will run to you. Help me, I, I, wolves are after me, I'm dirty, I'm stuck, in, I got sticks in my coat, I'm muddy, get me out of here. Those are easy to get. The lukewarm, they know they should be in there. They know who the shepherd is, but they're indifferent. So they stay outside and just eat grass. And You go get them, they run and run and run and run. You hold the cookies out to them, they get right up to it, sniff it, and then you reach out and they run. And it's aggravating. Any sheep farmers you have, almost all of them, if you go and you see where their place is laid out, almost always have one or two wandering around because they can't catch them. But they never leave. They stay right there. That's lukewarm. He can work with hot or cold, but he can't work with lukewarm. Now, you can go back and look at the different times, uh, what was going on then, and about the, the viaducts of water that they had, because there was two different towns that were there, and the water was super cold out of one and was super hot out of the other. But when they came together, they became warm, and it was nasty tasting. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, remember, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to believers. Because you are lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's pretty serious. What is he telling them? Verse 17, because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They have the world's goods, but they need the spiritual goods, and they don't have that. That's lukewarm. There's people that say, oh, if you don't obey the Ten Commandments, you're lukewarm. But you're not reading your Bible. That's not what lukewarm is. Because a Christian can look perfect on the outside, but be lukewarm on the inside. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. Lukewarm, lukewarm Christians, the, the, the Pharisees were lukewarm. And they were perfect in the law. They were lukewarm. They fulfilled the law perfectly. Lukewarm. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. That's the fires of tribulation. That's the, the troubles that we go through. That you may be rich. And white garments that you may be clothed. That's that fine linen. That the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. I wonder how many Christians are going to be standing before the Lord and end up being naked. Evidently at the wedding feast, remember the analogy of the wedding feast? One guy didn't have a wedding garment on. Evidently it, it might happen. Anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Verse 19, as many as I love, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. He's saying it's half and half. There's many people, I, many as many of you guys in my church I love, I rebuke and chasten the rest. Be zealous and repent. Be zealous and change your mind. Be zealous and reconsider your current path. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. That's fellowship. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
So as we went through this, if you were following along or you were listening closely to what was going on, and applying it to yourself and your walk with the Lord, what church did you fall under the most? What things were you doing that he was telling people to repent of? What things were you do you have in your life that lined you up with these churches that had issues? They were they for all intents and purposes were good Christians, but they had problems. There were things that he didn't like. There were some things he hated. Yet they were still doing them, but Christians. What are you doing that lined you up with the dead church? What are you doing that lined you up with the lukewarm church? If there was anything, do what he said. Repent. It's a good thing. Now, understand what repent is. Because people, you hear people all the time. Oh, they say repent of your sins. Oh, you can't repent of your sins. No, you're right. You can't repent of your sins. But you got to ask them, what do you mean by repent? What does that mean to you? And they, they most times can't answer. What repent of sins means to me, means to me, the actual meaning of it, is that I'm going to reconsider the sins that I'm doing. I'm going to change my mind about those sins. Instead of them being okay, they're going to become sin to me. And I'm going to agree with the Lord on this. And I'm going to confess them. So there's people that, that think they're holy rollers because they go into prayer when they pray, oh, Lord, I repent of all the sins I did today. And they think that, that that's okay and it's done, that's it. No. You need to know what the sin was in order to confess it. You don't just give a generalized statement about it. Lord, this sin I did today, and I confess this to you, and I know it's wrong, and I, I don't want to do it. And that's what he's going to acknowledge. And he forgives that sin. And Lord... I know there's sins that I did that I don't re realize that I did them. Lord, I confess those too. And I, I pray you make them manifest to me so I can take away the temptation. I can avoid the temptation. I can stop doing them. That I can acknowledge them and confess them to you. That's a desire to be pure. But people don't do that. They go into this great, grandiose prayer, prayer and they say, I repent of my sins. And that's it. Nothing else. And they think they're good. And you see their attitude from that type of understanding is they go out and attack other Christians with it. That, to me, is the greatest indicator of who you're dealing with. If a Christian goes and attacks you for what you believe or for what the Word of God says and browbeats you and makes, and makes it out like you're not saved unless you believe like they believe, that's a Christian that's in one of these churches that has problems. Instead, as a born-again believer, understanding what, the God, what God's will is, what they should be doing, what we should do, is when we find somebody like that, is go, well, that's not what the Word of God says. Here's what it says. This is what we should be doing. Repent. Turn away from that. Turn to this. Turn to the truth. Because you're condemning other people when you don't have that authority. There is no condemnation for us. Even the lukewarm church, there's no condemnation for them. But they, may not, they won't have any rewards either. You can lose everything. But be saved. I did a video talking about that just a couple days ago. Jesus himself said, many will enter into heaven, no reward. They'll be saved, but they're going to get there barely making it from the fires of hell. Barely. That's a lukewarm Christian. So, when you read this, apply it to yourself. See where you fall. Be honest with yourself. If there's issues, don't look away. Look right at them. Deal with them. You see some of that stuff, put your finger right in that thing's face and go, I'm going to deal with you. I'm going to the Lord right now because I'm not going to have this. I don't want this in my life. Deal with it. Address it directly. Sounds silly. Looks even sillier when you do it. For real. But just like we get baptized in water, that doesn't save us. It's a representation of a reality. And if you're in prayer... And you're picturing, you. sometimes you have to visualize it. And you visualize that sin sitting there, a little blob of nastiness sitting on your desk. I'm going to deal with you. I don't want you in my life. I don't want to have this in my life. I'm going to go to the Lord. I'm going to have this. I, I, I want this gone. I want you gone. I don't want you in my life anymore. Now people are going to watch you and they're going to think you're crazy. But just like we get baptized in water as a representation, as a reminder of a reality, that is a representation of a reality. I want sin out of my life. I've got this parasite attached to me, and I want it gone.
because that is taking my attention away from the Lord. Where's my knife? Where's my two-edged sword? Throw it away. It makes it more real when you visualize it. Again, people are going to think you're crazy. But it works. It works because it makes it more personal. It's a physical representation of a spiritual reality. Baptism is the same thing. A lot of people are highly against baptism. Oh, I think it's great. I think you should get baptized. Jesus said get baptized. It doesn't save you. And it doesn't add or take away from your salvation. But it was a command. Get baptized. It's an awesome thing. And listen, because I ran into some people talking about this. You do not have to have a pastor or a church or anyone baptize you. You can have any born-again believer baptize you. In a bathtub, anywhere, it doesn't matter. It's just a symbolic act. That's it. Anybody that's a born-again believer can baptize you. I've done it. You, anyone can do it. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, I baptize you for the remission of sins and into the glory of God. Welcome to the family. That's what the Bible says. It's there. And it's an awesome thing to do, too. When, you're, when you partake in it, you feel the Spirit. That Spirit, Holy Spirit, even though I have Holy Spirit in me, when the Holy Spirit falls on somebody after they get baptized, because it happens, you feel it. It's awesome. It feels good. So when you read this stuff, apply it to yourself. How does this apply to me? Lord, show me how this applies to me. If there's something I need to fix, I want to fix it. I'm going to work with you to fix it. Now, to him who overcomes, who is that? Well, that is in John. Uh, is it third, three John? Uh, no. I think it's in one John. Uh, da, 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 da. Where is it? Chapter 2. People are so dumb. You better follow the Ten Commandments. Well, you better read Second John. <laughs> or you better read First John chapter 2. They hate it when I do that to them. Uh, where is it at? Overcomer, overcomer, overcomer. I thought I had it highlighted. Love one another... I do not remember. Okay, I'm about to Google it. Hold on a second. Ah. 1 John 5, 5. Okay, it wasn't 1 John 5. Here it is. Okay, uh, 1 John 5, 4 and 5, 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. We are born of God. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. 1 John 5, 5. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Question mark. It's interesting that it has a question mark there. So when Jesus talks about that in those uh, in all those churches, he who has an ear, let him hear what the church the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes, I will grant this. He who overcomes, I will grant that. It's faith. Now look at the problems that all those churches had where he talked about, I have these problems with you. Lack of faith. Believe. Trust. Stay with. One of, the one of their favorite verses. Keep his commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. Yet trying to live under the Ten Commandments is a horrible burden. And nobody can do it. Nobody has done it. Well, I was sinless six out of seven days last week. 
that's great. That doesn't match the Bible. You actually go right back here to chapter 3. 1 John 3, 22, And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments, and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment. His commandment, just like what he said in the other one. This is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, as he gave us commandment. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him, and by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit who he, whom he has given us. End of debate. John literally tells you, the closest one to Jesus, repeated Jesus' statement, tells you exactly what the commandments are. It's the end of the debate. It's not the Ten Commandments. It's these commandments, love and faith. In love and faith, you fulfill the Ten Commandments. These people aren't reading their Bibles. And when you show them the truth, they won't receive it. Then they try to put the Word of God against the Word of God. No, you're wrong. Go to the Bible. The Bible is true. It tells you right there. It actually says it in several places. That's why I tell Christians, brand new Christians, John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, stay in those four books until you are secure in your understanding. Then branch out. Because John breaks it down. Simple and easy to understand and applicable. But they don't want to do that. They want to be self-elevated and self-elevated and self-justified and it doesn't work. Because Jesus tells us, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Therefore be zealous and change your mind. Let's go take a look at that. That's 19. Metinoeho. To think differently. Or afterwards, that is, reconsider. Morally, to feel compunction. Repent. What is compunction? A feeling of guilt or moral scruple that prevents or follows the doing of something bad. <clears throat> Definitions right here. And the Greek tells you exactly what it means. Well, you can't see that behind my picture. So why do people get this wrong when it's so easy to find the, the right answer? They want to condemn other Christians because they don't repent. What's your definition of repent? I know what, what the right one is because this was written in Greek. Koine Greek, the original language. There it is, right there. And it tells you exactly what it means. To think differently about your sin. To reconsider your sin. To think differently about your path. To reconsider your path. To think differently about your decisions. To reconsider your decisions. And then, morally, to feel compunction. To feel... To feel guilty. To feel sorrow, misgivings, qualms, worries, unease, uneasiness, hesitation, hesitancy, doubts, reluctance, reservations, guilt, remorse, regret, contrition, contriteness. That's an interesting definition. Self-reproach, repentance, penitence, contriteness. What does the scripture say? God draws near to a contrite heart. Psalm 34, 18. Uh, do I want to do that? Yeah, let's just go here. Psalm 34, 18. Oh, what is this? Genesis. Oh, come on, man. Psalm 34, 18, New King James Version. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. A contrite spirit. What's contrite? 
contriteness, contrition, compunction, saves those who have a guilty spirit, a sorrowful spirit. They're worried about their sin. They question their sin. They don't like that they sin. They have guilt over their sin. You're supposed to be sorrowful for that. We have joy, but we have joy in the fact that the Lord has forgiven us, but it should bother us that we have these things. And when something happens, and when we make a mistake, it should hurt. It's supposed to make us have conviction. But how many Christians don't? And deny that. And the Bible says you should have that. That's part of repentance. That's what it really means. That's the deeper meanings. And when you're like that, the Lord draws near to you. It should break your heart that you do these things. It should really bother you that you have this. Now, you don't let that stop you. You go to the Lord. You trust in Him. I have this stuff, but I don't like it, but I trust in Him. I know He's going to save me. I know He has washed me. I know He will finish His work in me. So, when people go around with a lack of understanding and start attacking other Christians about this, Number one, they're lukewarm. They're doing exactly the opposite of what the Bible says. They're showing hatred towards their brethren, which, according to Jesus, is murder. No murderer has eternal life residing in him. Remember that scripture? See how this leads into so many other scriptures? Yes, it says that in the Bible. I, I hear someone asking, where does it say that in the Bible? Oh, well, let's see. This is in 1 John 3.15. Awesome that it's right where we were at. 1 John 3. Verse 14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. That's an indicator. Love is an indicator of your salvation. He who does not love his brother abides in death. It's evidence of your salvation is the love. Verse 15, whoever hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him whoever hates his brother not not family brother christian brother and no murderer has eternal life abiding in him that should terrify people and it should make you stop and think wait a minute where have i done that i need to take a look I've done it, but the Lord cleansed me of it. He changed my He changed my mind. He caused me to reconsider these things. To rethink. Caused me to repent. Because I had a contrite spirit about it. I had guilt and sorrow over it. He fixed it. And he washed me of it. Because I confessed it. The Bible is true. All we gotta do is read it. And there's no special training for this. It's just listening to the Holy Spirit and reading what it says. And you guys are witnessing, literally, on the screen, how I'm finding this. It's super simple. Anytime you're reading your Bible, if you're using a Bible app, um, you need to have a Google, a Google tab open. Google that stuff. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That's talking to Christians, not unbelievers. There's warnings going out. The Lord is warning everybody. That's the final warning. Hey, y'all, pay attention. My word is telling you what to do. Be careful. Examine yourself. See where you are. Love one another. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Do I need to look that scripture up too? See, a lot of people don't know these scriptures are in the Bible because they don't read. They listen to someone else teach them. And then when you confront them with that, they say, oh no, that's a lie, I read the Bible. No, that's a lie. You don't read the Bible. If you did, you'd know these scriptures. You take a verse somebody gives you, open it up and look at that verse and highlight it and go, yep, I can use that against another Christian. I'm going to tell them Christians what for. No, 
That's not what you're called to do. That's not what any of us is called to do. But that's what they use. That's how they do it. That's how they read their Bible. See, I used to highlight. And highlighting and, and marking in the margins, it's, it's good. I used to do that. I quit doing that. I quit doing that because I don't want to pick one verse that's relevant. I want all the Bible to be relevant. So to me, the whole Bible is highlighted. Every word, every punctuation, every reference is highlighted. And that's just me. To me, every bit of it connects. That's, that's just me. To me, every bit of it is relevant. There is no part of the Bible that isn't relevant. Every single bit of it is. So if you went through this and some of this hit you in the heart, you felt that pang of conviction, that, that sharp stick, that goad that was poking you when we were going through all these churches. Examine yourself. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Because what that does is more align you with his will. And change it. Confess it. Ask for him to give you strength and change it. Whatever you do, don't be this church. Don't be this Christian. Don't be lukewarm. I know I get a lot of hatred for this stuff. I know a lot of people don't like this stuff. A lot of people attack what they don't understand. A lot of people attack what makes them feel guilty. It's the Bible, guys. And he gave this to us for a reason. Because he knew what was going to be happening in these end times. He knew what we were going to be faced with and what we were going to be dealing with. So he gave us what we needed to look at ourselves. Not a, I can't look at another Christian and go, hey, I look at myself. Take the beam out of my eye first. Then I can look at my brother and go, well, this is what the word says. See, this is why we read. This is why we study. This is why we look. We find these secrets. But you've got to do it from a place of, I don't want to find weapons. I want to find edification. Because conviction is edification. Because when a Christian is under a sin, they got a big rock on their back. When you walk up and you give them conviction, push that rock off, and they stand up straight. Edifies. They're edified. And when they stand up straight, they can see the Lord. They can see the path in front of them. And they're not burdened anymore. That's, that's part, of the, part, part of my ministry, is the conviction. And we all need it. It's a good thing. You want it. How would it be if, if, you, if you have a, a bo pot of boiling water and you don't feel the heat off of it and you just reach up and touch it? Heat radiates out. It's a warning. As you get closer, it gets hotter. Ooh, I better not touch. That's hot. It's a warning. That's what conviction is. That's that heat coming off of that problem. It's warning you, hey, that's hot, don't touch it. Get away from that. All of this is in life, guys, and everything in our life can apply. And we can use it to allegory, and we can break it down Barney style. So it's easy to understand and applicable to us. It's all in here in the Word. But we've got to redefine it. We've got to look for the answers and trust in the Lord for everything. I love you guys very much, and I hope this video made sense. And I hope there's people out there that are seeing it, that are th starting to, th they're thinking, hmm, One, I, I'm kind of getting the sensation that maybe that falls, I, I fall into that category. I need to fix this. And they go, don't come to me, go to the Lord. Go talk to him and tell him about it. Have him show you so that you can repent, so that you can reconsider, so that you can think again. And change direction. Just like I said over here in, was it 1 John? No. Up here. I forget where it is now. <laughs> My memory is so bad. So, please guys, reconsider these things.
Think about these things. Look in these letters and think about this stuff. This was meant for us. It applied to them back then, but it was meant for us. This whole Bible was. So that we would have a guidebook. They didn't have the whole Bible back then. We do now. It was meant for us. God put this together for us. Thank you, Father. So that we would have a guidebook. Full and rich with information. So that we would know. And nobody would have an excuse. Because nobody has an excuse. It's all right here. Alright, I love you guys. I bless you all in Jesus' name. I pray this video blesses you. And I pray this helps you understand more about yourself. But about how our walk is. And what the Lord is looking for in us. He has expectations, but they're really not that high. And it's simple, easy things. And how amazing is it that when we achieve those simple things, the, the far-reaching effect that it has, the first love. Matter of fact, before we close, let's do a search. Thank you, Foxy. We're actually going away the, uh, tonight to Johnson City for a weekend in a cabin for our anniversary. And I'm going to be still doing prayer videos from there, too. Supposedly, they've got a, a special, really pretty prayer area, a flower garden for it. So y'all get to see something pretty nice. Hopefully. We'll see. Um, let's look up first love. Love, first love, first commandment. Nevertheless, I have this against you. They have left your first love. I know your works, loves, and lasts are more than the first. So we have one in there with first love. Let me go into the King James and see if there's more. Let's go to King James. Uh, first love. Okay, it's just Revelation 2.4. So let's open that. Let's see. I have... No. So I wonder what this is. I wonder what our wonder what their first love was for that particular church. That would be a good study to get into. So look look closer at that because I think that applies to every one of us. Anyway, I want to leave you guys with that. Thank you for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.